yeah the class is being recorded yeah okay so this is dr sam abdel jalil and this is october 16th and this is an extra class we're finishing off season uh, tonight inshallah <coughs> uh let me share this the book Bismillah. where is hmm. Okay. Yes, that's the one. Okay, I think you can see Suzanne now, right? Can you see the book? Yes, doctor. Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, um, we didn't do that before. Uh, every time we come, we start with the... Uh, the items that the chapter covers and uh, as you can see before the items you have what looks like uh, a combination of paintings can you see them can you see them now no not yet i mean uh, we have I mean, this is the cover of the chapter. Only the, uh, yes, 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 the, yes, cover of the, the okay. chapter. Yes. So now that we have uh, spoken long about Cezanne, what, what, what do you make of this painting, if, if it's, a, uh, it's a painting, not a combination of paintings? Uh, is it typical of Cezanne's style now that we have spoken about him, now that we have spoken about his style? Look at, look at the painting. Yes, 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 it says yes, yes. Okay, yes. In, in what sense? In what sense is it typical of him? There is nothing clear in the picture. There is That's... no people, no mm. nothing. Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, quite uh, perhaps uh, more towards the impressionistic school of uh, painting, right? Where the yeah. focus is not on details you don't have actually details humor or, or, or otherwise right, right. Uh, can you look can you look i, I would like you to pay, perhaps pay attention to the paint brush and see whether they are uh, paint brushes and see whether they are uh, you know kind of uh, the strokes whether the strokes of the paint brushes are heavy or light what do you think they're heavy, they're not I, blended. Yes, okay. Who's that? Dania. Uh, Dania what? Dania Kojak. Dania, Dania, no, no. Are you artistic at all, Dania? Do you uh, sometimes catch yourself painting or drawing or something? Yes, I actually do. Yeah, well, yeah. So, Dalia or Dania, I'm sorry, is in in, in uh, you know, a better position than anybody else to perhaps uh, elaborate on, on the paintings. Uh, um, uh, how 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 did you see them, yeah, Dania? I'm, I'm sure you have very special a very special interest in the chapter chapter, given the fact that you yourself is a painter. Um, mm -hmm. I see them; they're like heavily and like harshly done done on the canvas. Mm -hmm. uh, he which is use... which is your t to to your taste or not? Um, not really. Like mm -hmm. I like my colors to be well blended, and like mm -hmm. and I don't like to leave any evidence uh, of the brush on the canvas. Mm -hmm. But he obviously uses the other thing, mm -hmm. um, and he doesn't use any kind of black uh, in his paintings. Like it's mostly when he wants to darken something, he uses blue, dark blue, mm -hmm. light blue, blue in general. Uh, are, you, are are you getting his messages? Uh, the fact that he he wants. He wants you to kind of, uh, he wants to, to uh, keep the barrier between, you know, imagination and reality. He's not in, in love with the idea of you as a spectator immersing and absorbing uh, what is happening uh, as if you're part of the, uh, the painting. As yeah. if you're, you're he doesn't part want of the two words to collide, like yeah. the reality and the fiction. Yes. He doesn't well, want... 
it. What do you think about that? I mean, if it's his point of view, then mm. let him be what whatever he wants to be. Mm -hmm. But like, mm. for sometimes the people who like likes to see things or like to give their opinion about something, they have to have a sense of living inside of it. But he's not giving that choice to them. Yeah, he's he's trying to make. Uh, I mean, he's making a statement. Life is life, and um, imagination is imagination. Yes. And exactly. obviously, the 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 two, according to uh, according to him, never meet, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, perhaps he's trying to say uh, enough. Uh, um, uh, perhaps illusions. Uh, uh, perhaps enough. Uh, uh, you know. Uh, artistic deception. Don't I mean uh, artists and paint, uh, whether they are painters or poets, shouldn't be creating this uh, illusion and uh, passing it off as reality for people because this is actually not reality. Uh, perhaps this is part of uh, of uh, a trend that was evolving at the time that that was called reality uh, realism. Realistic writing and realistic painting, right? Where they uh, reproduce reality as it is, not as it should be, right? When you look at the different paintings that uh, we have gone through, whether we're talking about the bathers and others, uh, as a genre, of course, he was deviating from the genre. He was not conforming to the rules the rigid rules of the genre if they tell him bathers he has his own way of uh, painting bathers if they uh, tell him uh, perhaps still life he has his own way of re uh, re reproducing uh, still life so again he was uh, perhaps part of a trend part of uh, you know um um, uh, yeah, a trend at the time that would say, no, uh, we should uh, keep uh, reality and imagination uh, separate. People have to uh, kind of uh, wake up from their uh, uh, this slumber that would tell them that uh, there is no separation between uh, the imagination and life. Because according to them, obviously, there is... Uh, uh, they are two different uh, things, um, and perhaps uh, he would uh, have this uh, political message uh, that uh, perhaps uh, because people have been um, under this uh, impression that uh, life uh, and art are one and the same, they 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 were not perhaps um, active enough to effect changes in real life. So. Uh, We'll talk about that um, more, perhaps, when the time is right. Um, okay. Again, we're, we're now trained uh, um, on how to deal with uh, Cezanne and uh, and the, the, the people that he uh, stands for. Remember, he was part of a big trend uh, um, that uh, perhaps started with him but w w would never end. Uh, we have other... Uh, you know, uh, people who also championed uh, changes in the um, literary and the artistic uh, scene. Okay. So where did we stop? We, we were supposed to start with the modern uh, nude. Okay, we spoke enough about him as being French, as being from the South, and uh, with heightened sensibilities with him. Uh, having to go all the way to the center, to Paris, in order to get recognized. And the fact that he got rejected by the Salon because he was not following uh, the rigid uh, rules and regulations and guidelines of the Salon. Uh, he would try uh, once and perhaps twice. And at one point, he would decide not to try again. He would uh, uh, meet with uh, people who were also rejected, other painters. And they would form what we now call uh, the Impressionist School of Painting. Uh, Impressionist, uh, and the Impressionist School of Painting would, uh, um, you know, the painters wouldn't uh, paint uh, according to the guidelines of the salon. Uh, somehow, 
uh, uh, because uh, the time has uh, perhaps changed because um, um, at, the, at the time there was also social and political revolutions. So people uh, were perhaps prepared and ready for, uh, you know, a, a corresponding and a battle re revolution in art. And this revolution was championed and was initiated by people like, uh, by Cezanne and his uh, uh, people like him. Uh, again, uh, he would be accepted in uh, the Salon, uh, perhaps after 19 uh, years. And when he gets accepted, he doesn't get accepted because he, uh, he is now um, a follower of the, um, the, um, the guidelines of the Salon, no, uh, because he, uh, the, perhaps the rules were uh, a little bit, um, you know, um, uh, more flexible than they were, and they would um, finally appreciate what he and his colleagues are, are doing. Um, okay. Um, um, whenever we talk, uh, yes. Sir. Uh, can I ask? Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I I want to understand uh, this point. Uh, yeah. He accepted the salon. Uh, can you can you called... can you mention your name, please? Yeah, I'm Raida. Raida, yes. Yeah, he accepted in the salon because he followed the deadline or the, uh, the rules or. No, the, no. Uh, Actually, because the like I said. He started off in the 1960s, perhaps, and he got accepted, uh, um, perhaps in the, in the late uh, 70s. Uh, uh, during that time, he was, like I said, he was, um, you know, every time he, uh, he tries to apply and he would uh, be rejected. So, um, uh, and he insists, he, he used to insist on, uh, on painting uh, on his own terms, not following the uh, guidelines of the salon. Um, again, I, I was saying that this was a time when there were revolutions in everything, revolutions in uh, politics, revolutions in uh, social revolutions. Uh, so people, uh, whether they are within the, the, the salon as jurors, as judges, or uh, outside the salon where psychologically ready to accept new ideas. So somehow, uh, um, Cezanne and his other impressionistic uh, uh, colleagues, somehow they uh, 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 could apply and somehow without following the guidelines, they got accepted and they got recognized. No, he didn't. Uh, bend, uh, he didn't follow uh, uh, the rules of the salon. The, perhaps the rules of engagement in the, sal uh, the salon were changed in order to accommodate for the so many people that are now applying, that, that are having their own different sensibilities, that have their own new ideas about art and how art should be uh, practiced. Okay, is that clear, Yagaida? Yeah, it's very clear. Um, okay, you, you're welcome. Uh, again, um, I was saying that um, uh, over uh, or during the uh, on this ongoing conversation about uh, Cezanne and the tensions that uh, he uh, and the conflicts that he had with the, the jurors and the judges of the Salon, uh, um, the idea uh, of the clash between tradition and modernity came out. Uh, of course, Cezanne and the Impressionists would uh, represent modernity, while uh, the judges and the jurors of the Salon uh, would be uh, representing tradition. And the clash would uh, uh, stay with us for uh, some time. And we will always have those comparisons between uh, be between Cezanne, who represents modernity, and uh, um, you know uh, other artists who represent tradition. The last time, if you still remember, we we did uh, a classical 
I mean, classical does not mean that he is, uh, he, he, he didn't, uh, he was born um, uh, uh, during the time of the uh, ancient um, classical writer, uh, painter. No, he was cl classical in his style. Uh, by the name of Borgo, if I still remember, and we spoke about the differences between the two uh, in details. Uh, today, like I said, we're going to talk about the modern nude, and we're also going to strike this comparison uh, between Cezanne and uh, uh, this classical uh, painter that we spoke about last time, Bogoro or Bogoro. Okay, um, uh, look at the phrase, it's, it's called the modern nude, okay? Uh, the modern nude indicates that there was or there is classical or classic nude. Uh, it means that we're having a new concept or a new vision as how nudes should be uh, given and pre presented uh, in the paintings, okay? So the, the word modern means that the, uh, there is another uh, type uh, of, uh, of nude that is classical, that is being practiced and, and, and exercised, and then that the fact that, that this modern nude is obviously going to be different. <clears throat> After we're done with that, we're, we're going to go to the um, a section where uh, um, we're going to talk about uh, Cezanne as a source of inspiration to a lot of paint, uh, a lot of painters. So it's called uh, this part is called the artist's art. He was the artist of the artists. I mean, uh, he was their favorite. So you have artists uh, and uh, their their favorite. Uh, would be Cezanne. We'll talk about that and why they uh, find uh, appeal in, in his work. And then we'll move to uh, the idea of Cezanne writing, uh, oh, I'm sorry, writing, uh, painting the, um, the landscape. And of course, uh, um, his, uh, the, the countryside, uh, where he used to live, would be a fit a place for that, for inspiration, and also for recapturing those kinds of uh, paintings where uh, you, you will have mountains and rivers and stuff like that. Um, and then after that, we'll go to such pure things. This is an item that would address the idea uh, that, uh, um, I mean, this is uh, perhaps, uh, um, rumors, uh, the idea that Cezanne was um, not an anti-women, uh, he was not a misogynist, he wasn't uh, a woman hater, but he was, uh, he, he has, he was sensitive towards women, in, in the sense that he wasn't, um, this is, this is perhaps, you know, like I said, um, are not very confirmed. The fact that he, he was trying to uh, perhaps steer away and avoid uh, perhaps uh, painting uh, women, and if he paints them, he paints them. Uh, you don't have this uh, emotional uh, over and undertones that you would feel in uh, paintings on or about women, as we're going to see. Um, and, and then we move to uh, still life uh, paintings. Uh, still life is a genre that he didn't start. It was there, but he, he perhaps mastered and perfected it. And, and then finally, we'll talk about scholars and owners. We'll talk about how the, um, you know, the social and the economic and the political uh, um, atmosphere and climate changed in France during the time, and with it, would there would be also a change of uh, how people look at art, uh, a reassessment of perhaps the position and the role of art, and all these kinds of things. Uh, let's go straight to uh, the modern nude. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes, yeah. yes. Yes, you yes. can. 
You can't. Okay. Let me check if Miss Fatma has it. No, she hasn't yet. Okay, this is the part that I was. Uh, this is a continuation of the uh, the talk about the difference between uh, remember uh, Bougourou uh, on the one hand and uh, Cézanne. Uh, and and this time around, uh, um, remember when we made those comparisons between the two, it was based on on the uh, on the bathers and the bathers, like we said the other day are women that uh, we don't have male bathers okay and uh, they are uh, typically and uh, in, in intuitively when we talk about uh, people bathing or swimming they are normally uh, uh, un, uh, undressed uh, so uh, we will we'll, we'll make uh, comparisons again between the classical buguru uh, uh, when it comes to uh, nudes and uh, uh, of course to um, uh, um, uh, Cezanne and uh, perhaps the word modern uh, is associated to him because Bougrou used to uh, paint uh, um, according to the guidelines uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, th this, this, this was a classical genre and Bourgou is classical and he was reproducing uh, the paintings, the bathers in a classical way, following the guidelines of uh, classical painting. Uh, again, uh, Cezanne would be uh, different. Different in what sense? Uh, um, again, when, whenever we talk about Cezanne and we uh, put him in comparisons with other uh, painters, we have to look at three factors. We have to look at this uh, factor that we call the imagined world as represented by the work of art itself. We, uh, this is a factor. The other factor would be the physical and the technical factor, I mean, uh, or, or the character of the work, uh, which means that we're talking about the, the painting itself, or the paint on, on the canvas. And of course, we talk about the the experience of the spectator. Spectator are pe uh, spectators are people like me and you. I mean, we go to art galleries uh, and uh, museums in order to look at these pain paintings and perhaps pass a judgment on them. Um, again, uh, what's the difference uh, uh, between uh, Bougourou uh, and uh, you know, Cezanne, uh, uh, when, when it comes to also bathers and the nudes and everything, it's the idea that uh, uh, with Bougourou, you don't feel, um, you don't feel affinities with whatever is presented. Uh, you don't have this emotional, as a spectator, you don't have this emotional uh, uh, bond or relationship with with the work. The work is uh, um, in the description of the writer here is unoriginal and bogus. It's uh, it's uh, it's fake. I mean, uh, you don't feel those um, hot uh, and and is exciting emotions and feelings that you normally establish between you and the work, especially if the work involves human beings. You normally have the, those, uh, or, or you normally try uh, as much as you can to establish uh, those affinities between you and the work. Uh, of, of course, if you have a good artist, he would allow you, he would allow you the opportunity, uh, opportunity to establish this bond. But with um, Bougrou, classical as he is, we don't have uh, this. Uh, his paintings, when it comes to human emotions uh, and the emotional content, uh, are not or or original. Uh, what uh, the effects that he uh, achieves are normally 
achieved by playing on the thoroughly conventional associations evoked by certain poses and situations. I mean, his work is rooted in uh, classical art. So if you're, uh, you as, uh, as a spectator, if you're uh, perhaps, uh, if you're familiar uh, with uh, classical uh, art and the, the rules and regulations of classical arts, uh, you will be, uh, he, he will be appealing to, uh, to your knowledge um, of classical uh, art. So uh, your knowledge are normally uh, about uh, how uh, people uh, pose in, in, in the paintings, uh, um, I mean, color, certain colors, uh, certain backgrounds. So what is uh, um, perhaps not very interesting about Bogoro would be the fact that you don't have anything new. It's not original. It's something that you, knew about it's something that you may find uh, other classical uh, painters are doing so there is nothing fresh uh, or original about what he is doing uh, of course um, uh, this is this is not be uh, very um, uh, this is not going to be to the liking of modern sensibilities and modern spectators who would like to see um, you know, fresh stuff, uh, perhaps something that addresses their uh, their own, um, you, you know, modern concerns and needs and everything. Um, again, so you will have with Bougourou and Cezanne, uh, you would have this clash uh, between uh, what, uh, what the modern uh, spectator sees in the work of Buguru and what uh, this modern spectator expects. What, what, what does the modern is, uh, ex, um, spectator expect? He uh, expects, he or she of course, expects to see uh, uh, things that are familiar. Familiar means that they are rooted in the modern world. Uh, okay. So to support the idea of a modern art was to regard the work of art as something made out of the materials of the present. So people like Bougrou would, wouldn't give you uh, that uh, because their work is rooted in, uh, in classical art where they normally drew uh, uh, on the uh, sensation uh, on whatever is literary and whatever is myth mythological uh, when you are uh, as a modern spectator uh, is focused on whatever is real uh, you uh, need to uh, to feel uh, fresh uh, and modern sensations the sensations of the real okay so who is going to do that? Uh, it's going to be uh, people like Cezanne, uh, where uh, uh, he would engage uh, you as a spectator. He would engage you actively with its, uh, with actual colors and forms, and he would try to st stimulate uh, a fresh emotional response rather than a reassuring sentimentality. Okay. So again, uh, uh, people, uh, classical uh, painters like Bougourou would give you the appearance of emotion. See, so he doesn't give you the emotion itself. He gives you the appearance uh, of emotion and not uh, the emotions uh, themselves. Um, again, Cezanne would uh, paint differently and he would uh, try to reproduce uh, uh, you know, actual uh, happenings. He would uh, try to reproduce um, modern reality rather than going all the way back to classical models and stuff. Um, again, we're talking about the idea of modern beauty, the fact that uh, as an artist uh, living in the 19th century, you should be recapturing 
modern uh, beauty and if the, this uh, this beauty has to be modern modern in the sense that you don't have to go all the way to the past in order to uh, bring us uh, classical models uh, you know from classical mythology uh, and all these kinds of things no reality i mean the modern reality um, can be uh, you know good uh, stuff that you can use it can give you enough material to work on don't go all the way back uh, the idea of modern beauty uh, beauty as as opposed to classical beauty was promoted by the french poet and critic uh, charles baudelaire baudelaire was a very famous uh, critic uh, he was a poet uh, by um, uh, vocation but he was also uh, uh, a critic and he would also try his hand with art uh, criticism so whatever he said about poetry uh, uh, people would uh, also apply to uh, art what did he say about poetry he was uh, like i said he was a promoter of the idea of uh, um, you know looking around you uh, uh, for inspiration, the idea that uh, we have uh, uh, beauty on the ground, we don't have to go uh, hundreds and thousands of years for inspiration. Uh, so he published a long and highly influential essay in which he characterized the painter of modern life. Okay, so the painter, if you, uh, if I would, uh, according to Baudelaire, if I would call you a painter, you have to be a painter of what kind of life, of classical life? No, you have to be a painter of modern life. Okay. So uh, Baudelaire conceived of the artist as a kind of receptive surface whose consciousness registered the distinctive flavor of the present as he passed through uh, the typical locations of uh, modern city. So as you can see, at the core of uh, Baudelaire's argument would be the idea of modernity, the idea of the present, of whatever is contemporary. Okay, and whatever is contemporary, where? Where it is in the modern city, not in the classical city. I don't have to go to all the way to ancient Greece and to ancient Rome for inspiration and for models. No, according to him, you, uh, uh, your uh, material would be stuff from uh, the modern city uh, where you are recapturing and reproducing uh, whatever happens in the present. So this is his uh, uh, concept of modernity that would oppose uh, the idea uh, of going uh, all the way back to classical models. <clears throat> uh, he, he would also say that um, art is normally about the tension that we normally have between whatever is modern and whatever is classical and perhaps uh, good uh, uh, poets would uh, uh, be those who can uh, reconcile those uh, tensions between whatever is old and whatever is modern uh, for Baudelaire Art demands a kind of tension between its abiding traditional values and its pre preoccupation with the fleeting aspects of the present. So you, you, as an artist, you have to have this tension within you. Uh, um, you. You have values, traditional values, that you would also think of and consider, and you also have, uh, um, you have to also be uh, concerned with the fleeting aspects of the present. Uh, according to him, the present is about whatever is ephemeral. Ephemeral means something that is short-lived, something that is not long-standing. So uh, modernity means ephemeral, fugitive, uh, contention. Contention means the not long-standing. So according to him, this is half art. Okay, so whatever is contingent, whatever is ephemeral and fugitive would be uh, um, 
half art and the other half would be whatever is eternal and whatever is immutable and that could be the classical models and the classical values so again your role as a good artist would be to reconcile the two um, and he has this uh, very uh, sharp observation when he said uh, he was uh, um, reviewing the um, the proceedings of one of the um, uh, annual uh, salon salon sessions salon sessions, and he he came that uh, he came up with the um, he observed. He said that uh, uh, there is a tendency among painters to dress all their subjects in the garments of the past, and obviously this is something that he doesn't like. Uh, they could evade the contrasting demands of the present or of realism. According to him, this is wrong. You shouldn't be referring all the way back to the past for models, for inspiration. No, you also have to deal with reality. And you shouldn't be avoiding uh, whatever is contemporary. Again, uh, um, um, as as a good artist, you should have this balance between tradition and modernity. If you can do that, you'll be doing a good job. Uh, <clears throat> and we're having the example of nudes. I mean, he was uh, obviously not him. I mean, the uh, the writer of the book is or the chapter is referring to uh, nude nudes as as um, as a genre as part of the bathers. Uh, um, and and the fact that uh, sometimes it doesn't uh, really work. And he has the example of Monier. Monier at one point uh, would have a painting by uh, the title or the name of Olympia, where uh, he uh, would uh, try to be totally modern uh, um, in the description of the in, in in the painting of a woman. And in uh, the woman was in in, in a modern setting, um, but the uh, the result was not very favorable. Um, uh, one one thing sometimes, uh, when it comes to controversial ideas and controversial things, would be the idea of not uh, giving people clues that what they are seeing is can be pinned down to reality, can be identifiable and recognizable, and which is something that Monier uh, or Manet didn't do. He was, his painting, it was called Olympia, and it was rooted uh, in the uh, tra traditions of the bathers and, 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 and the nudes in, in general, was very recognizable. Mm -hmm. And this is perhaps one reason why uh, uh, people didn't uh, accept it and it didn't resonate uh, well uh, with them. Um, again, um, to the credit of Cezanne, uh, um, he doesn't do that. He doesn't give you clues that would tell you that this is, um, you know, this is reality and this is something. Uh, he 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 uh, tries to be very uh, perhaps tactful about that by not um, by not being um, by not exaggerating uh, modernity and by not exaggerating uh, life at it, uh, as it is really uh, lived. Um, So again, so we're comparing Cezanne to both Bougrou, uh, who happens to be classical, a classicist, and also to uh, a modernist uh, like Eduardo Manier. And in the two cases, uh, um, Cezanne was uh, doing um, a better job. Um, uh, he was maintaining the balance between whatever is uh, classical and whatever is modern but in, in, in a very tactful way. Um, 
Cezanne himself would have his, uh, not Olympia, uh, he, he would have his modern Olympia, where he somehow uh, tried to learn from perhaps the mistakes of uh, Claude uh, Mon Manet and um, not, not being too direct. Um, uh, he has respect and he uh, for Manet and he likes uh, his Olympia and everything. Uh, uh, but uh, when he paints, uh, um, uh, perhaps a variation on Olympia by the name of uh, modern Olympia, he would he wouldn't use the same strategy. He would be more tactful. So it is significant, however, that his own painted nudes tend almost always to avoid the kind of direct confrontation with the gaze of the viewer. This is whom? This is Cezanne. Again, in order to uh, also avoid the backlash that uh, Manet got uh, on account of his uh, Olympia, uh, uh, Cezanne would uh, have uh, his uh, painting uh, I mean, the, the layers and the, the levels be arranged in landscape settings and to be uh, devoid of the kind of cues that would pin them down to a given present. You wouldn't uh, be able to uh, kind of pin them down and say, yeah, this is, this is that, and this is that. So the places are different uh, and the, the background is also different. Uh, so what makes Cezanne's bathers appear relatively modern is the simple fact that they don't appear classical, either in setting or in style. Uh, he, he would uh, uh, paint them with, um, you know, uh, perhaps defects and, uh, you know, um, imperfections that are typical of modern human beings. Again, we have this contradiction. At one point, we would say that uh, Cezanne is um, modern and uh, modernity is a reaction to um, classical tradition and uh, um, you know modernity is also a rejection of this class um, you know those uh, sets of classical traditions uh, however uh, in 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 assessing Cezanne one of the uh, critics would refer to him uh, um, as uh, as a classical writer I'm sorry, uh, as a classical painter. If you still remember, uh, there was this art critic uh, by the name of Rivere, uh, whom we quoted earlier, and he was referring to Cezanne uh, as a Greek. Uh, he, uh, he would say that uh, Cezanne would resemble uh, a Greek of the classical period. So how can he be modern? And, and and how how come uh, he can be a Greek of the classical period? Um, um, it doesn't mean. I mean, yani a simple interpretation of what Rivere was saying would be that Cezanne uh, was not a painter in a classical uh, way. I mean, he wasn't adopting classical style, uh, but. Uh, but he has this sense of, uh, you know, um, when you refer to something as being uh, classical, it means that it is perhaps well done. It is, uh, it is original and it, it, it's simple and noble and all these kinds of things. Uh, uh, perhaps he, uh, that would also be a reference to the fact that Cezanne would be a stepping stone for others. He would be uh, um, a classical for those who will come uh, uh, after him. He, he would be 
an icon that other people would follow. So rather than confronting, uh, conforming to a certain style, Cezanne's work appeared like a point of origin for what might come after. It was original, uh, and, uh, and his originality would lie with the emotion that the work uh, would uh, give rise to, uh, the reaction that people uh, have, and the effect that the work uh, would have on people. So this is uh, uh, this is his strength: the fact that he was fresh, uh, and the fact that uh, he has such uh, an effect on 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 the spectator. Um, and uh, uh, Baudelaire would uh, carry it further by saying that uh, Cézanne was, uh, you know, um, Cézanne and whoever is uh, um, painting in the modern uh, style and in the modern way would be more or less like a, a child that would approach things with a fresh, with fresh sensations, with uh, fresh eyes. Uh, looking for whatever is new. Uh, um, so, of course, freshness is against uh, lack of originality. If you're uh, following classical models, you're not fresh at all. And this is something that the modern spectator uh, wouldn't like. So you, uh, you as, a, as a modern artist, you would approach the thing with fresh eyes and with fresh, uh, you know, taste and everything. Again, we would uh, stress the fact that Cézanne, for all his modernity, he would learn from the mistakes and errors of other modern artists, and he would uh, work, and his work uh, might reassure, but could never provoke and challenge the viewer. Okay. Uh, over time, Cézanne would uh, kind of establish himself, and people, uh, especially artists, would uh, look uh, um, at him uh, for inspiration. He was inspirational for lots of people, uh, and his paintings were looked upon, and they were appreciated by lots of uh, uh, artists. So it seems that Cézanne's paintings of Bader's, for example, exercised a particular hold over other artists. Uh, let me just give you the names of those artists who got inspired by him, who were, um, you know, kind of um, uh, appreciative of his. Um, uh, of the changes that he made uh, in the domain of art. We have uh, people like Picasso in the 20th century and Matisse. Um, um, Matisse and others, and they would keep his, um, they would uh, uh, go and buy his paintings and they would uh, even try to paint uh, along the um, same lines and perhaps reproduce the paintings that he himself uh, um, painted. Uh, we also have the German poet Rainer, uh, Rainer um, Maria Rilke. Um, um, and this guy would say uh, something very interesting. He would say that at one point I was uh, kind of uh, puzzled by the style of, um, you know, Cézanne. I didn't uh, perhaps understand uh, what he was all about. And uh, normally my impressions were negative about him. And the fact that it, it took him uh, a lot of time, a long, long time before he realizes, reali realized that uh, Cézanne is not just another uh, painter and the fact that he was 
uh, one of the, the greats, one of the great uh, painters. He said that I, uh, perhaps I learned my lesson. It took me some time uh, to appreciate uh, Cezanne and his work. Uh, um, suddenly one has the right eyes. Right eyes means that he started to look at him uh, from perhaps the different uh, a different angle of vision, and um, uh, this kind of uh, revision of the work of Cezanne was, uh, um, you know, in, in favor of Cezanne in his work. Uh, again, uh, when Relk devoted the uh, the necessary. Uh, amount of time uh, he uh, could come up with the uh, the idea that Cezanne is a great uh, painter. And then we move to another uh, area of interest where the focus uh, this time around is on Cezanne as a, a painter of the landscape. Uh, again, as a painter of the landscape, he would uh, recapture uh, the uh, reality of, uh, um, uh, of, his, um, of the countryside where he hails or comes from. Um, there was uh, obviously no better uh, place uh, um, to recapture, if you're talking about landscape, if you're talking about mountains, if you're talking about rivers and uh, perhaps simple people and stuff like that. So again, he's going to uh, to uh, perhaps go all the way back. Uh, perhaps this is after he, he had established his reputation as a great painter. He would go all the way back to the countryside and he would uh, uh, get an inspiration for his landscape paintings. So one contributory factor in Cezanne's reputation as it developed at the end of the 19th century was his attachment to his native province or um, province where he comes from. I mean, uh, and and this, I mean, this is what he says, for example, about uh, where he comes from. He says, when one is born down there in the south of France, nothing else means a thing. It means that he, of all the places that he traveled uh, around and traveled to um, his native town or his native village remains um, the most uh, outstanding. Um, again, this would also be a point of uh, difference and separation between him and the Impressionists. So, of course, you know that Impressionism uh, or French Impressionism, Impressionism and art uh, was uh, created and was invented in, uh, in Paris, in the city, uh, uh, when they got rejected from the Salon. And the salon, of course, is in Paris, in the city. So it is a city movement where the focus is on the city and its perhaps its concerns. Again, uh, with uh, somebody like Cezanne, with those heightened sensibilities, with this with this passion for the countryside, uh, um, uh, that wouldn't work uh, uh, for him. He would. Uh, leave them behind, uh, and he would uh, again uh, have his inspiration in the countryside. So again, this is why he he would leave them behind and uh, chart his own way when it comes, especially to uh, the painting of the landscape. So uh, from the mid-1870s to the end of his life, much of Cezanne's work was devoted to the rural uh, scenery of, of Brivance, or province, which like uh, this is where he, um, he came from, where he was born. 
uh, which, uh, like his bathers and his still lives, appear largely untouched by the social and technological processes of modernization. Uh, again, um, would he come back to Paris? No, I mean, he, his visits were infrequent. He didn't go there much or often. Uh, but he would have his uh, relationships and affinities and connections with uh, lots of the um, the painters um, in the uh, impressionistic or the impressionist circle, like uh, Camille and Bizarro or Bizarro and others. Again, uh, being away um, and being away this time around uh, because he decided to be away, not because he was kicked out of the salon or something, being away, uh, imposing a, a certain uh, style of life on himself, uh, uh, gave him the appeal uh, or gave, gave him appeal among uh, people. He would be referred to as a reclusive genius. Uh, again, um, they would also compare him to uh, those, um, uh, they would refer to his art and him, him uh, as pure and classical and all these kinds of things. Um, uh, the focus in his um, landscape, landscape painting was on Mont Saint Victoire. This is obviously uh, a mountain in his uh, native uh, town, and uh, it would feature very um, heavily in, in most of his. Uh, uh, paintings and in, uh, in over 30 of, of his paintings. Um, you, I mean, of course, that's a recapturing of the mountain and uh, from different angles and everything. Again, uh, where, where did he uh, take uh, these uh, or where did he paint those paintings? He kind of uh, bought or rented a studio that would overlook the mountain and that would allow him the opportunity to uh, kind of uh, paint the mountain. Uh, again, uh, we have this kind of uh, uh, reconciliation that uh, a good painter should have or should uh, make between, um, you know, whatever is fleeting and whatever is contingent and those, um, you know, um, values or classical values. Um, um, again, that, that wouldn't work with lots of the Impressionists, but somehow uh, it, it worked with Cezanne. Cezanne was to remain committed to the aim of truth, to the immediate sensation of nature, but he is reported as having said near the end of his life, what I wanted uh, was to make of Impressionism something solid and durable, like the art of the museums. So again, he would subscribe to uh, uh, their uh, guidelines and principles, uh, and uh, and also those of Baudelaire about uh, you know capturing whatever is fleeting, whatever is contingent, whatever is e ephemeral. But he also said that I would also uh, like to uh, to. Uh, preserve uh, to my paintings 
uh, and the paintings of the impressionists, whatever is solid and whatever is durable. We need them to be uh, uh, like the art of the museums. Um, and then we'll have this comparison between him and Boussa. Uh, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing the name correctly. This is another uh, perhaps uh, French painter, Nicolas Boussa, who uh, was um, a major figure in the establishment of a classical style of painting in the mid 17th century. So the comparison here is uh, remember when we spoke about bathers, um, the comparison was with Bougoro, who was also a, 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 you know, uh, somebody who, uh, who uh, painted in the traditions of the bathers. This time around, we're talking about landscape paintings, and uh, the comparison here is with N Nicolas Poussin, or Poussin, I don't know how to pronounce uh, his name. Okay, so how different um, and how similar um, Cezanne is, well, again, when it comes to, um, you know, um, landscape paintings. So in terms of similarities between uh, Poussin and uh, Cezanne, we'll, we'll, we'll see that both of them have tall trees framing the space at the left. Both of them have buildings catching the light slightly further back on the same side. And both of them represent extensive views over a large enclosed area. And both have projecting mountains in the far distance. These are the similarities. How about the differences? The differences uh, would have to do with the, um, the scenes uh, that are depicted. Um, in the case of Cezanne, for example, there would be, or there, there is always this absence of any human or animal life um, uh, with, uh, <clears throat> with Poussin, you normally have goat herd and flock. Um, again, the, the main, uh, um, you know, um, difference would be, um, you know, it has, it's, it's, it's technical. And it's also about this relationship between virtual picture plane and actual surf surface. Um, whether we're talking about Cezanne or any other writer, uh, I'm sorry, painter, modern or uh, classic, we have to always remember uh, um, that when you have, um, you know, before any painter paints, uh, he has uh, this flat surface and uh, uh, the challenge would be to turn this flat surface into uh, a life of its own with, with different dimensions. Of course, being, uh, you know, surface being flat would be one of the dimensions. So how uh, um, you can have other dimensions would be uh, the challenge that any uh, painter would uh, engage in or uh, meet. Um, Okay, another, uh, and, and obviously, if you're a painter, you can do that. You change this flat um, uh, rectangular shape into, uh, into something totally different that has different dimension. This is one of the things. The other thing would be the idea um, of where you stand when it comes to the idea of the barriers between uh, reality and art. Are you trying to uh, kind of impress on people, on your spectators, that art and reality are one and the same? And in this case, you're trying to, to break the barriers between uh, um, the two. Um, when I look at the painting as a spectator, 
I, uh, you try to engage my, my senses and my feelings so that the next thing I know is that I am uh, perhaps a, a persona or uh, I am uh, featured in, in, in the painting. Are you trying to do that? Or are you trying to tell me, no, you need to always remember that you are in front of a painting. This is not reality. This is perhaps a reproduction of reality, but you have to keep them separate. Okay, so uh, classical painters like Boussin, especially when it comes to the landscape, would uh, impress on you that, it, that there is no separation between reality and uh, uh, the painting. Uh, while people like Cézanne, uh, modern as they are, they try to always uh, wake you up and say, listen, you, be, you need to be attentive. You need to not let go. You, 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 shouldn't be, uh, um, you shouldn't be carried away. Uh, uh, and uh, and to the extent of uh, feeling that you're part of the painting, that the, that the painting is reality. No, this is not reality. This is perhaps a reproduction, a recapturing of reality. So this is also one of the basic differences between uh, Bossini or Bossin and uh, uh, Cézanne. So uh, to paint a picture is to do something to that surface so that it will appear other than flat, of course. Uh, this is typical of any painting and this is typical of any painter. Uh, um, you, uh, at the end, when you finish, uh, your painting becomes a self-sufficient world, okay? So the real question would be whether to keep the illusion that this imaginative world is reality or not. So if you try your heart to keep the illusion that the imaginative world that you have established uh, is real, you are classical. If you're trying to uh, kind of uh, keep the barriers uh, and the division uh, and, to, to, um, and, and separate reality from the imaginative world, you are modern. So uh, if the finished painting is to have the power to affect and to absorb its spectator, as part of this process, the artist must establish an imaginary position from which the whole makes sense. Another way to put this is to say that what the artist must do is not to conceive the scene as something that an imagines spectator is seeing, but also to conceive it as that spectator sees it, as if to accord the spectator a certain identity and disposition. <clears throat> so as you can see, in, classic, in traditional classical paintings, such as Poussin's, that plane is made more or less transparent, okay? So the artist customarily works to make spectators forget, and this is very important. The artist customarily works to make spectators forget that what is actually being looked at is a flat surface covered with more or less expensive varieties of pigment. Thus, the spectators may the more easily become absorbed in the pictured scene and in whatever incident it may contain. Uh, you become part, as a spectator, you become part of the painting. You totally uh, 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 forget that you are outside the picture, that, uh, that we have two realities. The reality of the imagined uh, world as uh, given in the picture or the painting and your own reality as a spectator. This is... Uh, Poussin, and this is classical painting. But in the case of Cézanne, uh, the paint never quite ceases to look like paint. It's, it's uh, You realize 
um, that it is a paint. The cannabis to appear as a cannabis. However, compelling the illusion of pretendism. I mean, it can, the illusion can be very compelling, but uh, the artist, the modern artist, makes sure that you understand that you're looking at um, an imagined uh, product, if you like. Am I making sense? Okay, so the implication was that the difficult relationship between the virtual, the virtual means uh, the imaginary, and uh, the actual might be what Cezanne's painting was really about. Uh, again, um, the tension between whatever uh, is uh, virtual and whatever is real is also at the core of any uh, um, successful painting. Okay, and then we come to the idea that uh, um, Cezanne was actually um, um, you know, uh, was kind of trying to, uh, um, he, he was not very, uh, in, in, uh, on very good terms with women. It doesn't mean that he, he used to pick up fights. I mean, he, he himself was married at one point, but it's not about that. It's, uh, I mean, if he has to choose between uh, perhaps painting uh, women and painting other uh, subject mat matter, he would go for uh, other subject matter. Um. Uh, what uh, perhaps confirms the impression that he was not um, at ease with women and their uh, perhaps their presence and company would be the idea uh, that um, he he wouldn't have live models to work on. He wouldn't have uh, perhaps hire models, women, flesh and blood, and he would uh, kind of. Uh, you know, have those uh, painting sessions, uh, painting them. Um, he would um, rely heavily on on uh, on women images um, uh, of of other uh, painters. If if he if he has to, of course, paint women. Um, again, like I said, the work of earlier painters he admired. Uh, so that Cezanne suffered from a fear of women and in general of being touched is a well-established component in the mythology of his life. We're saying mythology because it, it was in Kung Fu, perhaps these are mere impressions about him. Um, again, that would also uh, perhaps clash with the idea that the women figures that he used to uh, paint uh, would appear um, uh, com compellingly tactile, and so tactile it means that they are touchable. Um, uh, they they account they um, sometimes they get uh, perhaps um, uh, inspired and uh, influenced by uh, by these ideas about him and women and they would say that whenever we have women featured in his paintings and the and the bathers for example we see that women are have this air uh, of completeness and self sufficiency. Uh, um, you, um, what he's trying to say that they, uh, for example, they, do, they don't need 
male uh, figures around them. So um, uh, female self-sufficiency is, uh, uh, is not a good thing according to them because obviously uh, um, uh, life is made up of uh, males and females. Uh, and that would account for the lack and the absence of sentimental appeal, which is a telling feature uh, in, in, in his women uh, paintings. Um, uh, and this is something that uh, even Relic would refer to. Uh, I mean, he, he used to send letters to his wife and he would refer to this particular point. Uh, the idea of dispassionateness, and this is what he says, the marked absence of sentiment, sentimentality when it comes to uh, Cezanne's uh, female or women pictures. Are you following? Okay. Do you, do you guys have any questions so far? No, doctor. Thank you. Mm, things are clear. No, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There's um, a lot of information to memorize, doctor. I wouldn't. I wouldn't call them information. Um, don't look okay. at them as um, information. Otherwise, uh, information would require you to memorize stuff. These are not uh, pieces of information. These are interesting, uh, um, you know, uh, perhaps uh, tips as how you can approach, um, you know, painting. We're, we're used to literature, but this time around we're, we're having, uh, you know, uh, painting. And this is something new. And um, it is understandable that if, if you're not uh, a painter or an appreciator of uh, of paintings yourself you would find it difficult but just give yourself uh, uh, the time perhaps to uh, to go and revisit the stuff and look at it look at the uh, the paintings um, try to uh, kind of apply the tips that we have uh, shared about uh, what kind of paintings, uh, look at the backgrounds, look at the colors, look at uh, whether there are details. If you engage with the painting, I'm sure uh, these words will come, uh, uh, you, know, you know, will come alive and things will be clear. Don't approach it as uh, perhaps a chore or a, a job. No, uh, just uh, allow yourself the opportunity to appreciate what uh, what you have, okay? Um, Miss um, Fatma uh, Abel Hassan replied, and she said that she will, inshallah, uh, provide you with details about uh, the exam or the quiz style, inshallah. So as soon as she sends me stuff, I'll share it with you, and perhaps she would. Uh, um, you know, uh, send you an email or post something on the LMS. So I would like you to check the LMS on a regular basis. Okay, so let's go to... Uh, okay. Still, okay. Um, still life, if you still remember, this is what we started off or started, I'm sorry, this is what we started with. Remember those yes. uh, Good, number answer. of, you know, um fruit um items they, they were orange there were uh, there was also uh, um like, like a jug and right remember them remember that one one of those still life paintings was bought um for uh, did we say 60 60 million dollars right <clears throat> Uh, we spoke about that, and we said, uh, uh, was it bought, uh, the painting was bought because it deserves this, uh, or um, because it's worth it, or or what? And and we, we said that it's uh, because of the, the fact that it, it is associated with the name of Cezanne. Cezanne is now an established painter. Um, he is part of the artistic uh, 
uh, Canon. He is a, a big canonized uh, painter, and it's only natural that when uh, uh, people uh, buy paintings, they also look at the name of the painter, like they do with Shakespeare, for example. If I give you uh, a play, and I say we're, we're doing this play, and it is by Shakespeare, and of course you know the um, you know Shakespeare, high and mighty, canonized, and everything. You wouldn't say that this is bad. This is right because he is canonized and because he is established. But if I um, if I don't if I hide the name from the play, if I hide the name Shakespeare from the play, you are uh, perhaps at liberty to say uh, your mind and to say whether you like it or not. Okay, so it's the, it's this hold that canonized and established writers and painters have on the audience. Okay, so let's talk about still life uh, as a genre and see uh, what it is all about when it comes to Cezanne. So these, uh, as you can see, these are the components of still life uh, paintings. You have ordinary kitchen table with a single drawer, the patterned dark blue cloth, the glazed stone uh, ware jug, the plain rustic fruit dish and white cloth, and the lemons and the oranges and all the other uh, kinds of things. This is typical, right? Um, uh, the, the question is, um, it uh, remains. Uh, is um, Cezanne the creator or the pioneer or the inventor of this uh, genre? Of course not. It has always been there. But of course, uh, Cezanne added value to it. Uh, of course, we're talking about a specific painting, still life painting. It's the still life curtain, juggle, and compotier reproduced in plate 131. Okay. This is the one that we're talking about. See? Um, so what, what, can, what kind of feelings would you have? What kind of sensations and impressions? What, what do you think the topic is? Why? Why did he um, paint it? What are the messages that he is trying to uh, get across to us? Any idea? Hmm. I'm asking you. Hello. Could you repeat the question, please? Uh, I mean, um, can you can you see the painting? Yeah, you can. See this it. is a still life painting. Yeah. Uh, my question is about uh, the messages that the painter is trying to get across to us. Obviously, when when they paint. Uh, um, every painter, like every um, every writer, has his own agenda. He's trying to communicate ideas to us. What are the ideas that he's trying to communicate through a, a painting like this one? That maybe this is our life, what it would be mm. like. Like yeah, this uh, is the reality because he blended the um, the colors. Uh, yeah, and the reality everything. in what? And when you say reality, so obviously, <laughs> this is not an idea. Reality in 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 what way? Um, in drawing, what like what is actually in our lives? Like he drew the apples or pears in the jug mm -hmm. as the way it is in our real life. Like there's nothing imaginative about it. You mean uh, you mean our life is as drab, is as ordinary? Maybe something like mm. that. Like I really don't get quite enough of his message, like behind this painting. 
Yeah, it's okay, man. It's uh, you know, I mean, it's different interpretations, and uh, okay. Can we have somebody else? Yes, doctor. Yes. Yeah, maybe the message is is about uh, simple life. Yeah, yeah, that 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 that's a possibility. What's your name? Samara uh, Aziz. That life, uh, for its complexity and for its complications, is simple at at its core. This is what you're trying to say, Asamar? Yes. Okay. Because obviously he draws simple things like apples and mm. there is a fruit here. So I think it's about simple life. Uh, perhaps he was hungry. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> because uh, Perhaps he was hungry and thirsty because you have this jug and I'm sure it's full of water. <laughs> yeah, I think that too. <laughs> I didn't okay. know, but I agree with yeah. Samar. I agree with Samar. I, I, What's I, your name? I'm Raida. Um, what? Raida, I, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. agree with her because also, uh, I see that I um, see the simply or um, modesty in um, this paint. Mm. Um, there's no something... Um, Yeah, the, there is nothing big about life. This is what life comes down to in the final analysis, if you like, right? Um, my voice is gone, I think. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think um, there's nothing, something uh, luxurious on, or uh, mm. uh, I mean, the simply. Is it a call for humility? Is it a call for humility? Perhaps he's calling on people to humble down. Yeah. What do you think? Mm, okay. Can, can do, I think we have gentlemen. Perhaps they can add perspective. Satam, do we have Satam around? No, we don't have Satam. Uh, do we have other um, gentlemen that would like to perhaps uh, contribute input? Okay. Show the technique of yeah. modeling and dimension. What's your name? Luai Tariq. Tariq? Yes, sir. Luai. Luai, okay, Luai, go ahead. Show technique of modeling and dimension. Whatever that means, yeah, Luai. What is the message? Look at the different elements of the painting and perhaps establish links and relationships and come up with an idea. Uh, yes. Morality, morality. Morality in what sense? Morality. Okay. Morality. Morality. Morality, yes. Okay. Morality. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Luai. Okay, interesting. Let's move on. Um, um, again, it's um, 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 this is a genre in and of itself, and it has always been there. Um, it uh, still life as a genre emerged as a fully independent type of subject for painting around. 1600, and it became prominent during the ensuing century, especially among painters in the uh, Protestant low, con low countries, means uh, Holland and Belgium at one point. Uh, it was common for uh, still life pictures to be designed as allegories. Okay, this is very interesting. Allegories are more or less like metaphors. You're presenting something in order to tell uh, people in, in uh, perhaps a figurative and in an imaginative way about something uh, um, far and beyond. You may have, you know, like you have seen uh, pieces uh, of fruit. You have, you may have an old jug. You may have uh, a table 
cloth that is perhaps dirty or simple, okay? All of that can be, a, uh, can be an allegory or a symbol. You know what symbols are. So you present something, but you mean something else, okay? So, um, so symbols and allegories are meanings beyond surface meanings. The surface meaning in a still life um, painting would be that you have apples uh, um, and other uh, fruit, you have a jug, but the, this is the surface, uh, this is obviously the surface meaning. This is what you, this is the first level of analysis. But um, there is another deeper level of analysis that would focus on uh, um, you know, um, looking for for symbols and for associations, and you try to uh, link the symbols together and the associations together, and you, you come up with with something big. Uh, okay, so what are the allegories that you may have, uh, um, and those allegories can be uh, also linked to uh, other allegories in other, uh, um, you know, uh, aspects of the culture, whether it's literature or mythology or uh, even uh, paintings and art. Um, <clears throat> so when you look at the objects and when you put the objects together, you can, um, you know, kind of interpret the painting and you can read it symbolically. Uh, again, you, you, you cannot escape or you cannot miss uh, uh, the idea that um, uh, the painting is about simple things, fruit that the, the place uh, where the painting is painted uh, looks, um, you know, kind of very simple. Um, the table and everything. So perhaps this is a call for humility. Humility means that you need to be modest as a human being. Perhaps this is a reference to the fact that life uh, should shouldn't be we shouldn't be complicating life we should always remember that life is short uh, we should always be aware of the fact that uh, um, our all our struggles and conflicts uh, and our searches for for material stuff are all for nothing because we eventually die and leave everything behind Right. Uh, so it can. One of the interpretation would be the transience of sensory pleasures and material possessions. Uh, life. This is what life comes down to, and this is actually. Uh, were, uh, this was a trend and a tradition that was called vanitas, and the word vanitas means vain. Vain means. Uh, when something is vain, it means that it's um, short and valueless and it comes to an end, uh, exactly like life. And this is also a, a religious and, and biblical motif, the vanity of vanities. Sometimes we, we talk about the vanity of human wishes. Uh, wishes here means dreams. You have dreams and you're trying to do this and you try to do that. And uh, you, you run and you struggle. You have conflicts with people over material position, over inheritance, over uh, uh, a job, over a promotion. And you don't realize that you're uh, a heart beat away from death, right? Perhaps uh, this is one of the interpretations that life is short and we shouldn't be, uh, you know, doing what we're doing for something that is short, uh, 
something that is being glorious. So vanity's paintings are those featuring objects that have clear associations with the passage of time and with death. Okay, and the, the big slogan would be remember that you must uh, uh, die. You're getting the idea. Yes, Dr. Okay. Question. What's your name? You need to raise your voice. Uh, Maryam Al Ajmi. Maryam Al Ajmi. Go ahead, yeah, Maryam. Was it because of his attachment to his native town or countryside? This, I mean, the symbol life of his, like this, um, still. Uh, yeah, you mean uh, the reason why he took up this genre would yeah. be that he used to live uh, in a simple kind of life at uh, when he was first born, and yeah, that's that's yeah, that's part of it. It could be right. Yeah, yeah. Still, life is about simplicity, uh, and uh, people who come from the countryside, like Suzanne, are very simple, right? Yeah, and the city people that needs to humble. Like you yeah. Okay. So if it's uh, if it's it's a message to city dwellers and city people, it's about humbling down. Yeah. It's about stopping uh, pursuing uh, uh, material stuff, yeah. uh, acquisitiveness, fighting for material stuff, uh, and in the process, of course, if you fight for material stuff, you would anger a friend you uh, uh, would uh, perhaps uh, upset um, a parent. We, we do all kinds of stuff. Reacting in life, yeah. Yes, okay. So um, uh, perhaps um, uh, um, a painting like this would uh, uh, tell people, uh, please humble down. There is obviously more to life than just the pursuit of material gains, uh, what I call material cupidity. You know, cupid, the god of love. Yeah. So material cupidity means that you are in love with material. Material could be money, uh, could be cars and positions and jobs and all these kinds of things. Allah Is that clear? Yes. Thank you. Thank you okay. so much. So again, they may suggest religious and philosophical reflection on the privity of life. Uh, privity means shortness of life and the, uh, on the emptiness of worldly achievements. Again, you can be achieving, but you know, at one point you would die. And uh, material, uh, this is very pessimistic, I know. <laughs> uh, uh, perhaps we're overreading it or something. Uh, but it can it can also have political overtones and messages. Uh, if you look at the different elements and you see how uh, you know how arranged they are, the fact that they are independent uh, away from each other, and this can also be political in the sense that uh, and social as well. The fact that it is true that we work and operate within groups in society. But we are individuals with uh, um, identities of our own. So the focus on the way the individual fruits are represented in Cezanne's painting and on the ways in which they are related one to another, the more it seems that individuality and relationship are here uh, being given substance as values in themselves. So you can be part of a group, but don't forget your individuality. Okay. And then we move to scholars and owners. Okay. 
So this part is basically, I know you're tired and everything, and this is the last part. This part is about the, the, um, the changing atmosphere uh, um, in the 19th century uh, in France. Um, you know, France at one point, um, you know, had gone through a number of revolutions. Um, and those re revolutions were very sweeping, sweeping in the sense they changed the uh, the the political uh, and the social scene um, completely. Uh, of course, we we start with the the Great French Revolution in the uh, late eighteenth um, um, century. And then uh, there were a number of other revolutions and uh, the fact that the system of government changed more often than not until it settles down, settles down towards uh, perhaps the end uh, uh, of the 19th century. So uh, if you have political and uh, social revolutions, you also have revolutions in taste. Um, okay, because uh, revolutions, whether they are political and social, are made by and for people. And if they are made by and for people, uh, um, um, the, um, the, I mean, pe uh, it's, it's, it's people who appreciate uh, art and, of course, literature. And they were also either part of the revolutions or recipients of the fruits of those revolutions. Uh, you need to also uh, think of the um, uh, the social order in uh, um, uh, the French society after uh, those revolutions. And, and the fact, remember, there were the aristocrats, so those who were affiliated to the um, to the royal um, um, to the royal family, the royal family will come to an end uh, with the um, big revolution in the um, late nineteenth century. Uh, I'm sorry, eighteenth uh, century, and a new uh, kind of government will come over, and with it will come, um, you know new classes we will have what we call the middle class um, and there is going to always be this tension and conflict between the remnants of the royal family i mean noble people aristocrats uh, very rich people who uh, who got this um, the riches through inheritance and you would have the middle class and the middle class, or what we call the bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie, those are going to be people who came from the bottom. They are self-made. They made, they charted their their way up by working very hard, and they became rich. Um, you know, aristocrats uh, and uh, people who are rich by inheritance and through affiliation to the royal family would have those refined sensibilities. They received re education at uh, the best of schools, at the, the best of, uh, with the best of teachers. But middle class people, uh, they are middle class, but they have now, they have money. Uh, they are educated to the levels that would allow them to work well and to amass and collect money. So we're going to have this tension between the two sides. Who is going to be dominating the artistic and the literary scene? Are uh, um, the uh, aristocrats um, uh, and the remnants uh, of the old system, are they going to stick to, to their positions and they are going to be also controlling the social and the artistic scene, or are the new uh, rich people, those who got rich through hard work, 
the middle class in the Portuguese, uh, are they going to have the upper hand? But this is what we're having. Uh, the scholars here would be a, a reference, of course, to the aristocrats, to uh, people who have refined sensibilities because they received good education, those who are perhaps talented. Uh, they are either, uh, they got um, their uh, education at best schools and by best teachers, and uh, you would add to them the artists. Uh, uh, the owners would be uh, the middle class uh, people, the bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie, the merchants, who have, you know, this level of education that would allow them to negotiate their way around, but they, they don't have those heightened sensitive sensitivities uh, and sensibilities. They are not they're perhaps well read, they are not well uh, educated. So the two uh, uh, classes are going to fight and their uh, battlefields would be art and literature. Okay, and that would, uh, depending on who is winning, uh, uh, um, uh, we will have um, this image of art at the time, whether it is uh, the scholars who are winning or the, the owners, who is pulling the artistic threads. Are they the owners through their money or are they the scholars through their perhaps uh, education and sensibilities and everything? Uh, so the owners, uh, what do they think of paintings? Do they do they uh, look with them with you know perhaps um, um, you know? educated eyes they really appreciate the work of art and then they eventually buy it because they appreciate it or do they do they look at it as perhaps items that they should collect so that uh, other people can say that they are rich it's something that they can be uh, proud of or they can post uh, among their uh, perhaps uh, friends and family members okay scholars uh, when they look at uh, pieces uh, of work, they of course look at them from um, you know artistic uh, viewpoints. They have those critical eyes that can tell whether this is uh, this is a, a good piece of work or this is not. Uh, this is something that the owners do not have because they are merchants. They are middle class. They haven't received uh, as much education as the scholars did. Okay, so where does uh, Cezanne stand? C Cezanne is, uh, is he a scholar or is he uh, an owner? What do you think? Scholar. He's an owner? What does he own? Scholar. He's a scholar, yes. His father was, if you still remember when we first spoke about him, we spoke about his father. And we said that his father was a self-made, um, you know, man. He became a banker at one point, right? Remember, he was um, involved in the industry of hats. He was, uh, you know, making hats, and he could uh, climb the social ladder, and he became uh, a businessman. So, as a businessman, he is an owner, right? While his son, Cezanne, who is a natural born, uh, you know, painter, is a scholar, right? So if Cezanne's father go to a museum or an art gallery in order to check the paintings, he would, would he buy them because he knows that they have artistic values, internal and artistic values, or because he wants something that he can hang on on the walls of his villa, for example. What do you think? He wants something special. 
He wants to collect items. Yes, something that he can uh, post uh, uh, around. He can yeah. Yeah, tell people, uh, listen, I have this or that painting, right? Yeah. But uh, if Cezanne goes to the same art gallery, would the experience be different? Would would uh, what Cezanne uh, uh, be looking for uh, be different? He would criticize. Yes. Yeah. He has those sharp critical eyes yeah. that would tell him that this is a good piece of work and this is not uh, a good one, right? Yes. Mm, good. Uh, we're also referring uh, here to uh, uh, perhaps um, uh, an essay by Baudelaire uh, where he is addressing the bourgeoisie, the middle class. So is he addressing, when he addresses the bourgeoisie or the, um, the middle class, is he addressing the owners or the scholars? What do you think? The scholars? No, bourgeoisie middle class. Middle class are owners. The owners. Right? Yeah. Okay, he, uh, he's addressing them and he's obviously telling them uh, it's uh, perhaps um, it's, it's your time now. You are, you have all the money and uh, you can buy anything. And he, I mean, he is ironically uh, talking to them, uh, perhaps making fun of them. And he's saying that you guys are going to set and impose your own values. And those values are not necessarily ours as scholars because our values are artistic values, while your uh, values are perhaps commercial values. You, you would buy, a piece of work and keep it until perhaps somebody else comes over and asks for it for perhaps a higher uh, a higher price, right? Uh, he's telling them that he's talking to the owners, to, to the bourgeoisie, you are the majority in number and intelligence. And you are the force, the force that uh, that would move things around. And he is uh, thinking or uh, perhaps uh, 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 talking about a time when the scholars shall be owners and the owners scholars. Um, again, until this time comes, and he knows, of course, as, uh, that it's not very soon. Until this happens, uh, uh, the situation is going to remain. Uh, uh, that you are having the upper hands and our the artistic taste is not going to be uh, uh, as we wish it to be, where we have refined sensibilities. Uh, again, he's asking them to perhaps um, get educated, get knowledge so that you can be able to enjoy the forbidden fruit of knowledge so that when you go and look at paintings and decide to uh, perhaps buy them uh, your uh, decision decision would be uh, based on uh, artistic uh, you know artistic principles rather than on commercial um, gain and benefit Uh, this is basically uh, what uh, the chapter is about. I know it's uh, very tiring, but uh, it was a long journey, right? It took us uh, three uh, uh, classes, right? It took three classes to finish. Uh, but I'm sure if you uh, read it one more time, you'll, you'll find it very interesting. You can always connect the dots together. Um, so, do you guys have any 
questions? No, thank you. Okay. Okay, so as soon as I get uh, um, the word from Ms. Um, Fatma, I'll relay it to you on the WhatsApp group, inshallah. Inshallah, Dr. Okay, okay inshallah. Okay, Dr. Okay. 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 Yes. Uh, could you please tell me what should we focus on while, while we're, we are studying? Um, focus on the bottom line, <laughs> whatever that means. Wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, um, I, 